So, um, hi everyone, and thank you for persisting. I am here today, I think, on a little bit of missionary work. So what I'd like to do is kind of change everyone's point of view about this kind of quiet revolution that's been happening, not at the top tier of HPC, but around the base of the pyramid. And that is this idea of how we can use OpenStack as a means of managing the system, managing the users, providing the runtime, and all of these other things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how OpenStack can do HPC infrastructure and how well it works for HPC applications. So does it actually suck in terms of performance, or is it pretty good? I, I think it's pretty good, but I'll show you why. And also a little bit about what's going on around the world with this scientific OpenStack community. So um, we're going to look at a few case studies. And um, after we've covered a little bit about what's right and what's wrong, I'll try and make a case to, uh, to change your point of view. And if you have a, an opinion about whether OpenStack works for this, and you came to that opinion uh, before a month ago, then I'm afraid that opinion is probably out of date, because this is an environment which moves really quick. So a little bit about me first. Um, this is my career to date. Uh, that's me in Wales. I started in 1992 at Mako a parallel supercomputer maker in the UK. I moved on to Alpha Processor in, in Massachusetts, and then I worked at Quadrix, and then I worked at Nodal doing software-defined networking. Then I joined Cray. Um, well, Nodal was acquired by Cray. And then I started working on OpenStack, and this idea that we might be able to use OpenStack in order to manage HPC equipment. Uh, then I left Cray about a year and a half ago, and I joined, or I, I co-founded a company called Stack HPC. So we looked at this idea of how, in the community, can we actually build this environment, bring together all the people who are doing this, who are on this sort of convergent evolutionary path, and bring them into a, a single open stack scientific community. So that's what it's all about. But before we go too far, I'm going to step way back and something that I'm not involved in, but is a very good place to start and lay our scene. So this is going back to September 2015. This is a machine in the middle of uh, nowhere in, in the United States, it's called LIGO, and it can hear gravity. And they started using it in 2015. It's actually two pairs of perpendicular uh, vacuum tubes. So this is the vacuum tube. It's over four kilometers long, and there's another one which, I don't know whether it's behind the camera or in the distance, which goes off at a right angle. They've got two of these, one at each end of the country, and what it does is it shines a laser down the vacuum to a mirror, back again, and then the two lasers meeting from these orthogonal tubes will intersect and interfere, and they measure from the interference patterns very slight changes in the fabric of space, uh, so that the tube is actually getting slightly longer and slightly shorter. And when the, the theory predicts that when a gravity wave goes through, one direction, one dimension is going to get longer, and the other one is going to get shorter. And this is the whole purpose of this machine. It has been 40 years from its first conception to powering up. And I think that is a testament to the ingenuity the creativeness and the sheer sort of bloody-minded perseverance of some experimental physicists. And in reward for that, they'd been running it for 10 days, and they detected their first gravity wave after 10 days. So pretty good, pretty good effort for 40 years. I think it's, all, it's tuned for a very specific event, which is a massive event um, on a sort of a cosmological scale, which is the collision of two orbiting black holes. You imagine this doesn't happen very often. So 10 days, and then they had two black holes bashed together like that. That's pretty lucky, I think. Uh, so what they know is that the two black holes were 29 solar masses and 36 solar masses in size, in weight, in mass. And when they, when they collided, they created the mother of all bangs. It gave off three solar masses worth of matter in terms of energy. And if you think that the, the biggest H-bomb that's ever gone off in the world let off about two kilos of matter, three suns worth of matter went off in the form of energy. 
for a tenth of a second, it was brighter than everything else in the universe put together. It was enormous, but nobody noticed, apart from this thing, because it was all in gravity. So we're seeing the universe through an entirely new set of eyes or ears uh, with this machine. So this is pretty spectacular. It's got a slight problem, though. So when this incredible explosion or the incredible explosion of energy came to Earth after a 1.3 billion light year journey, it moved the four kilometers of this tube by the, by the equivalent of a thousandth of the radius of an atomic nucleus. It was very, very, I don't know how they detected it, but it was very fine. And this is a part of the problem is that the, um, the gravity waves that it is detecting are so massive, yet so weak and so sensitive that this machine can only really detect the most enormous and the highest frequency gravity waves uh, that are theoretically in existence. So we're talking about a bigger, a bigger machine. No, not, not bigger as in bigger tubes, but a, a different way of thinking about this. Relativity predicts that gravity waves could exist that have a wavelength of like the entire solar system. Really, really massive things. So instead of talking about those gigahertz uh, radiation, we're looking at nanohertz uh, frequencies. So this is, these are really, really very different things to be trying to detect. And there is a creative approach to increase the baseline of our detector. And that creative approach involves bringing in another of the cosmological oddities, which is these um, very fast pulsars. So these radio emitting stars. Many of them, you know, we've detected a few thousand of them across the galaxy. But if we can detect all of the pulsars in the galaxy and pick those as our perpendicular baselines, then we get these millisecond accurate signals coming from these pulsars. And we can see the sort of the wobbling jelly of space, perhaps with this very much larger um, uh, instrument. It's quite an interesting project. It's really just carrying, just getting started now, this sort of pulsar timing project. But to really get it going, we need a bigger machine. We need the mother of all radio telescopes, which is this thing called the Square Kilometer Array. The SKA is um, hoping to advance many, many causes in cosmology. And uh, this is another one. Uh, so this is probably the biggest infographic you're ever going to see. It is the entirety of space uh, for the entirety of time. You aren't going to get a bigger one than that. And um, so, so really, one of the other um, ambitious projects of the SK is to look further back into this, um, this thing they call the cosmic dawn, which is when, when in, in the beginnings of the universe, the first objects started to emit light or radio or energy. So being able to look very much further back, we can see some things, new details about the very first stars, the very first galaxies, which were formed under different conditions to the, the stars and galaxies of the universe today. So they're unusual things. You know, the stars are enormous. The galaxies are strange shapes. It's, um, it's a very interesting area that we can currently just see dimly. So we want to be able to look really far back into this background radiation to, and look far back into the beginning of time. Right, I'm going to bring it back on course now. So to do this, we need a lot of number crunching. So the SKA machine is actually two very large arrays of telescopes or uh, detectors, one in the desert in Australia and one in the desert in South Africa. They generate 5,000 petabytes a day of data. And after the first sort of the first stage of correlation and the interferometry processes, that's reduced down to 50 petabytes a day. This data has to be consumed and digested and converted into meaningful science products for the primary science experiments of the SKA. And that needs a machine which is estimated by the SKA consortium to be about 250 petaflops in about 2023. So we've got a little bit of time well, they've got a little bit of time to put this machine together and to start on or to, um, to build the concept of this system. But really, 
five years is, or six years is, is not nearly enough in many ways. And so they've, they've already been working on the science experiments and, um, and some precursors to the, uh, to the big machine. But in terms of the compute system, we, I've been lucky enough to be involved in a little project to do with evaluating some of the early performance prototyping that might be going on here. So this is one half of a machine we've got at uh, Cambridge University. It is the SKA performance prototype, and it's coming online um, at the moment. Uh, it's uh, a couple of racks of kit. We've got um, 100 gig InfiniBand. We've got um, 25 gig Ethernet. Uh, we've got a load of GPUs. We've got a load of NVM, NVRAM. We've got a, a few ARM64 nodes, and we have some nodes with high, high technology, high memory, sorry. What is particularly interesting to me is that we've also started using OpenStack to manage these resources. So this is um, how we're doing it on our project today. And as much as we are evaluating these different hardware um, technologies to see which ones are the runners, we're also looking at software technologies. So the SKA consortium has a broad range of approaches underway at the moment. They're looking at Spark. They're looking at containers. They're looking at some very sort of high performance um, storage options. They need to bring to all together all of these things together into a machine which can accommodate them without them all treading on each other's toes. So this really fits very well into an OpenStack um, frame of mind. Given that the, um, uh, the machine is not due to go into production, uh, the, the big machine until 2023. That's also kind of handy in that the OpenStack Z release comes out late 2022. So uh, we've got plenty of time to, uh, to figure out what goes into that. So why OpenStack? I mean, why, why, why are we thinking about OpenStack for this? It's cloud compute, right? What's the, what's the big deal? So this is another piece of the infrastructure at Cambridge. It's not normally as blue as this. And um, uh, this is a machine which is the primary HPC facility at the university. It's, it's called Darwin. It's got 9,600 cores. It's got EDR and Finiband. It's a very well-managed, um, conventionally structured HPC system. It supports its users well. It's always used. And, um, it's getting old now. It's getting replaced this summer by a new machine, which will be um, several times bigger. But, uh, but this is the, the best game in town at Cambridge at the moment. It's got a little bit of a problem. When we look at how the university, how the users of the university are actually exploiting this machine, if we look at the stats from the Slurm queues, we see some interesting things about the size of the jobs that are going through this machine. So you see here, we've got job size along the bottom, and we've got a number of jobs along the top. And we can see that a lot of the users are really following this high throughput com computing model. So we've got 16 cores, and we've got one core. So we've got sequential jobs, and jobs that are using all of the cores in the node. It's probably, I mean, it's a very biased representation because a lot of these jobs will be um, we're very short, uh, and the 1024 node jobs on the far end they probably run for a long time, so we're not looking at accumulated CPU hours, but I think it, it reinforces that this HPC system, created using very nice, tightly coupled, um, high-performance network fabrics, is actually not what the users are looking to use. It's not what everyone is wanting. And the other interesting thing about Darwin is that it's also using a lot of uh, containers. So it's using Singularity. Singularity is useful for these guys because they don't need to install anything outside of the, um, uh, outside of the, um, uh, the installed software base on the compute nodes. Singularity runs unmodified on, without modifying the, the host system. So this is good for them. But it also shows that one kind of runtime environment in a compute node is not good enough for everybody because some people want to be able to run their own software images inside of containers. And they're going to the trouble of being able to do this so that they can create a system on their laptops or in their, in their faculty systems and then port it straight away, unmodified, and run it on the HPC system. It's pretty good. We've also got 
other kinds of software coming in here. So this is the software stack of an ambitious project in computational bioinformatics that's going on at Cambridge. This is for Genomics England and the 100,000 Genomes Initiative in the UK. So we've got a whole load of interesting and, and varied pieces here. We've got an HPC cluster. We also have a Hadoop cluster. So the HPC one is doing the base alignment. So it's using a lot of things like um, AVX and MPI. It's using CUDA for GPUs. It's doing a lot of classical HPC capabilities. The Hadoop cluster is also pretty optimized, but it's optimized for running Hadoop. It's got its hardware is configured in an optimal sort of um, HDFS configuration. And it's running HBase principally, but also Spark and other applications from the Hadoop ecosystem. We also have a whole load of other sort of like NoSQL databases and um, a whole load of other things. We've also got an interactive web front end. So this is very much a non-conventional application for an HPC system. Doesn't really fit the mold. So we look at this and we think this is going to work well as an example in a cloud environment, in a private cloud environment. Why would we do this? So firstly, the people who are using an OpenStack system or a private cloud system, they can sort out their own infrastructure. They can sort out their own platforms. They can sort out their own software. If they were using a different kind of software or they needed some something changed about the machine in, on Darwin, that creates tickets. Tickets creates toil. Toil is time for the operators in, who are thinly stretched already. There's plenty going on that they could be doing instead of servicing tickets to install packages and so on. We can create this infrastructure, but they can create it too. So this is great. I mean, self-service is a big win for the users. And this is really the driving um, impetus behind why we'd want to use something like software-defined infrastructure as embodied by OpenStack to meet the research requirements of our user base. So what does OpenStack do? I mean, what can it do that actually helps us here? So we can use, users can have their own application stacks. They don't have to use the software image that the admins have created for the HPC system, which has what the admins think is the best choice of packages and, and so on. They can actually, um, I mean, they can set up their own HPC environments inside of the, the, uh, the cloud system if they wish. They can set up their own web environments. They can set up their own long-term infrastructure, you know, Git repos and, and so on. In a university environment, we have a lot of faculties and each of those faculties, the people might want to work together, but they might not actually want to work with, or they might want to get impacted by other people's work from other faculties. We have people who are industrial partners. We don't, they don't necessarily want to see each other, and they might not necessarily want to see what's going on outside of their own world. So we have this idea of sharing and isolation, which OpenStack fits naturally. There's three pillars to what OpenStack provides for infrastructure. So we have a virtualized system, which is the, uh, the one for which it is best known. But also we can do containers and we can do bare metal. But I'm going to focus for a little bit on the virtualized system here. So the easy thing we can do is we can create a bunch of machines. And then we can offer to our users VMs in the, in the way that makes sense. But then. On those VMs, we can build platforms. We can build workload managers. And let's say that we have a, a team who don't want to use Slurm, which is the standard one in Cambridge. Maybe they want to use PBS. Maybe they want to use Talk. Maybe they want to use something else. SunGrid Engine, who cares? We can offer that easily. It's like a script. We run a script, pipe pops up, a, a workload manager is there ready for them. And it's the one they want, and it's set up how they want it. This is useful. But we can go further. I mean, it's, if you're creating an OpenStack cloud and you're using it to provide Slurm and, and MPI to your users, you're kind of hurting yourself because you've taken a machine which is a bare metal system and you've made it a little bit slower and a, little, a lot more complicated and it kind of does the same thing. So we can also run 
other applications. And, uh, and really, you could name your own, name your, make your choice here. I mean, it's, um, we have R, we have Redis, Hadoop, Spark, Elastic, uh, Cassandra, and MongoDB here. But you could do anything. And, and in fact, you can do a mixture of all three and perhaps a bit of Kubernetes as well. Why not? So now we have a system which actually is able to deliver any of the requirements that our users might make of it. So we go back to the application stack of the um, OpenCV for our genome analysis. And we can see that actually this kind of fits. We can construct a software-defined infrastructure which would work on here. But the principal problem and everyone's gut feeling is going to be, well, the performance is going to suck. It's going to be terrible. And so that's where we have been working, my company and Cambridge, on generating a best practice and bringing in a lot of HPC technologies into our OpenStack environment in order to lift the performance, in order to understand the bottlenecks, and in order to deliver systems like this, software defined, triggered by a script or the click of a button, but without sacrificing overhead by doing that. I guess that before we go too far, though, we go back to that, that problem of um, OpenStack does VMs, it does bare metal, it does containers. And I guess that in fairly soon you're going to have this question, which is best answered in the terms of uh, robot Shakespeare, I find, uh, which is to, to virtualize or not to virtualize. And I guess that we have done a couple of these projects and we've followed either, we've explored all of these paths. And I'm going to share a few thoughts and a few results which might help about, uh, about that decision. So each has its own implications. Uh, this is a bare metal OpenStack system. So the Cray team that I was working in was working on early prototyping and early stage developments towards systems like this one. Aurora is scheduled to be running OpenStack in a bare metal context the control plane for Aurora is going to be booted as OpenStack instances. Here's another one. This is a bare metal machine. This is Bridges at PSC. This is an Omnipath machine. This is about 1,000 compute nodes along the bottom. Uh, the blue links are the 100 gig Omnipath network going up to the yellow blobs, which are obviously um, Intel Omnipath switches. And then further up, we have some special purpose compute nodes, uh, storage nodes. The big yellow squares are 12 terabyte RAM nodes. This is an OpenStack system. It's been running for a year, and it runs, well, last I heard it ran OpenStack Liberty, but it was due for an upgrade. It looks HPC. It is HPC, but it's running OpenStack. So go figure. We heard today about Jetstream, which is easily the shiniest machine I've seen. Um, very interesting talk from, uh, from Mike and Dave earlier today about that. Going down scale a little bit, so uh, my, my drawing is, is a little bit less flashy, but this is the machine, this is the concept of the machine that we installed in Cambridge for life sciences work. So we have a bunch of um, standard Dell PowerEdge compute. These are kitted out with Mellanox ConnectX4 LX Ethernet. So this is 50 gig Ethernet. And we attached four different types of storage. So this is a storage-heavy system. We have um, two classes of Next Center. We have Ceph storage, and we have Lustre storage. So we bring together pieces from the cloud ecosystem, pieces from the HPC ecosystem, into the same machine. The network across the middle is Mellanox Ethernet. And we made a layer two network here. So this is a layer two fabric. Um, it's 100 gig paths across the middle in multi-path configuration, and 50 gig down to the compute nodes. To bring together a machine like this, we needed to, and, and to have it perform in a way which wasn't shameful, uh, we needed to do a few tricks. So we did a lot of work on the architecture, and we did a lot of work to bring in some of the RDMA capabilities that we have available to us by using Mellanox Ethernet and Rocky. So we used RDMA in the hypervisor, and we used RDMA inside the VMs as well. We worked hard with these, uh, these great band of companies along the bottom uh, to bring this all together. And when you get to the far end, an OpenStack 
RDNA capable compute node looks a little bit like this. So what we got, uh, we've got VMs and the VMs are running open fabrics. And this little thing here is a passed through SRIOV virtual function. So these come down to this guy. They're like a mini me of the Ethernet, the Merlinox Ethernet NIC down here. So we can do open fabrics, we do IB verbs on this guy. And um, we also do IB verbs inside the hypervisor for our storage, for the, for the hot buffer storage um, using these guys. We also have a more conventional um, OpenStack or cloud style networking path, uh, which goes down to a 10 gig ethernet. And that goes up to para virtualized software NICs into our VMs. So this is, the, this is the cloud networking and this is the HPC networking. They sit side by side. So the, um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's the rest of the talk. So, yep. <laughs> uh, so the machine is principally for analyzing brain images. Uh, this is a guy called Dave. And um, um, I don't think his brain is literally this color. <laughs> but um, so we're going to look a little bit about some of the RDMA technologies and how they work and what the impact of virtualizing is for them. Because actually this was one of the, one of the biggest areas where there is a disparity even today in performance is on the IOPS of storage. And um, so this graph is to our, this is RDMA storage into um, OpenStack VMs. So we're using iSCSI over RDMA into the hypervisors and then we re-export that as a cinder volume into the VMs. The RDMA, if we use the bare metal and we access that as our iSCSI, uh, we see that the RDMA storage is capable of about three gigabytes a second. It's um, six SSDs in a RAID and then another 50 gig Mellanox NIC. So that's what we'd get in the hypervisor is bare metal as a function of IO size. Uh, these are reads. If we then run the same test inside a VM, we see that the up to about 64K, the performance is just night and day awful. But that's, there's many reasons to this, uh, partly because the VM is not gonna be, if I ask for like 512 bytes, the VM is not gonna go off and fetch 512 bytes. It's gonna fetch a whole big block of data and then present it back to you. So this this performance down here is indicative of the way that hypervisors, uh, QMU in particular, are managing the I.O. on a network-backed block device. So we make small operation, we make small reads down here, but it's doing big reads in the background. And then actually what's interesting is we get this reproducible effect where for larger, act, larger operations, virtualization is actually faster than not virtualizing. And I don't know why that is, but other people see the same thing. I'd be kind of interested to know why that is. So uh, then we get a second tier of storage. So this is our Ceph storage, which peaked at about um, um, 900 and something megabytes a second. So this is a storage really which is the second tier. It's, resi it's resilient, it's redundant, it's high capacity. It's not meant to be remarkable. It exists to back up when the, when the hot storage is, um, is not being used. So then we can look at the effect of virtualization on things like MPI. So for our, for our VMs and our workers, we want to be able to support doing MPI using SRIOV, and we want to be able to support doing cloud networking using TCP and the usual sort of um, OSI network stack. So this is what we get from the Mellanox NIC in bare metal mode. So we're just under two, two microseconds latency. This is MPI latency as a function of message length. And so we, we, what's interesting here, I've, I've plotted two lines because they're two different MTU sizes. Now we were kind of interested in this because we were exploring whether MTU for storage is actually gonna help if we raise it up because that's the, that's the classic wisdom. So we thought, well, well, let's have a look. So this is, the red one is standard ethernet MTU and the green one is jumbo frames. 
And what we see is that for latency, there is a clear penalty to using jumbo frames for the storage. And if we virtualize it, yeah, the blue line is the same test run inside a VM. So the difference is actually pretty small. I mean, 10%, if that. It's less than half a microsecond. So this is two microseconds here. And we go from being 1.8 to about 2.1. For most people, that's OK. The Cray system on the, in the previous presentation from Lucas, I think I saw 1.2. So we're not, we're not slow. We're just not the fastest we could be. But that's what the HPC system is for. And we're making a home for all those high throughput jobs. So, so we're interested in rack scale scalability here. And I think that this level of latency is pretty good. Similarly for bandwidth, so in bare metal, we see that jumbo frames only really become a benefit above about 100k rides. And then they become a sort of medium scale benefit there uh, for our machines. And when we virtualize, we see the same bandwidth. So no difference there. So, so what are we waiting for, guys? Hey, what is this all about? At, at the kind of scale that we're looking to provide for our parallel users, so we're looking to provide a rack scale system here uh, for our virtualized users, this is pretty good. I mean, this is good enough. Then we get on to what is the OpenStack networking like? So here we had quite a lengthy investigation, and it brought in quite a bit of the Mellanox technologies that we've been using. But first of all, we started out with... Um, two VMs, and we used a single thread, a single stream TCP, so we use iPerf between the two. I think the reason I chose that is that I think it's, it's careful, you've got to be careful to avoid looking at how many TCP streams to go for all out bandwidth, because actually most people care about their TCP streams. So I looked at the single stream bandwidth performance. Cloud vendors will want to look at how much they can get through on aggregate, I care about the bandwidth between my two VMs. And that's what we got. So this is iPerf bandwidth. That's about 1.6 or 2 gigabits a second on a 50 gig NIC. Oh. <laughs> hmm? uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's not NAT. It is, um, actually, it's not going through a floating IP. So where did this time go? Um, this is pretty awful, and, um, and so we had to stop for a thing for a bit. So, so if we look at the VM at the top here, and we do some IP routing here, and we go down, and we come back up, all of this stuff here is what the hypervisor is doing to implement the rich networking that OpenStack provides in a software-defined context. So actually, we have a third piece here. So we've got a para-virtualized NIC. Between these two OVS bridges, and the power virtualized NIC, there is a Linux bridge, there are some IP tables, there is an OVS bridge for integration, there is an OVS bridge for VXLAN in cap and DCAP, then we go out on the wire and come back and we go through the whole same thing again. So we've got a whole load of problems here, and the, the interesting piece is that when you look at the system performance by profiling the kernel on the hypervisor, this is what's going on inside the VM, and this is what the hypervisor is doing. This is where the time is going in the hypervisor for networking. So it is the, uh, the sort of the fatberg of SDN is right here. But fear not, because it's KVM. Uh, these, the, this machine is uh, Red Hat OSP deployment, so it's, uh, it's uh, RHEL 7.2 and KVM. Then we notice that if you look at the Mellanox website, the community site, uh, you get these really awesome numbers here. So 20 and a half gigabits a second for one pair of VMs, which is what I'm doing. Only I see about 1.6 gigabits a second there. So I'm thinking, this is great because I've got, I've got ConnectX 4LX. I'm, I'm a couple of generations on from this. Why is it that I'm not seeing 20 and a half gigabits a second? So this really comes down to a whole stream of problems that we had to overcome on this OpenStack system in order to get it to sync. So firstly, we looked at how to tune the BIOS up for some HPC-style uh, config tweaks. So for example, we turn off hyper-threading, and we see the effect of that. 
In the cloud world, we typically run with hyper-threading enabled. In the HPC world, of course, we usually run with it off. Then we looked at some of the software config inside the kernel, and we tuned the hypervisor. And then we looked at some other things that we could do instead of this. So that's where we were, and we tweaked the BIOS according to the HPC best practice, and we got a bit. So we got up to about two gigabits a second, two and a bit. Uh, this is no good. So then what we looked at is um, we changed our kernel from the Red Hat kernel to a 4.7 kernel. We got up to about 10 and a half or 11 gigabits a second. Now the, the reason for this is because the new 4.7 Linux kernels are able to do TCP offloads inside of a tunneled connection. So VXLAN is tunneling, and now we can do TCP offload engine work inside of, the, inside of a VXLAN tunnel. So the team at Mellanox support came up with this, and we got a, um, a very good boost because of that. But unfortunately, that also meant that we no longer had a supportable machine uh, because Red Hat won't support you if you're running a different kernel version. Obviously, and that's just like, it goes without saying. What is useful, though, is that we have a very close partnership with Red Hat at Cambridge, and, uh, and Mellanox do too. And this capability, I believe, has been backported into the 7.3 kernel, in so that um, if you upgrade your Red Hat, um, your Red Hat distribution, you will actually see this benefit without having to upgrade your kernel. I haven't tested that, but take it from me. So next we turn off hyperthreading, and this is the boost we get by running with half as many cores, but actually running with beefier cores. But now you can see that actually this performance is getting quite erratic. And we think, figured this is because the CPUs inside of the VM are jumping around because they're not pinned. They're not pinned down to underlying physical cores. So we pinned the CPUs down, and we see nice, steady performance now. But actually, kind of disappointed it didn't go up. Actually, I was very disappointed at that. I was, it took me a little while to, uh, to get that in place. But um, it's not always a forward step with optimization, I guess. So then we, we looked at the next problem in hypervisor tuning, which is this idea that, that a VM is essentially like a, a white thing. It's a, a white box. So you can't see, or you, ca you can't really see what's going on inside the hypervisor. It's, it's just a foggy thing. And, and you have a number of cores, and, um, and you don't really know how they, are, how they interconnected with each other. So we need to pass through the details of the PCI um, locality and the NUMA locality. And when we do that, we go up a bit more. And now we're here. We're about 24 gigabits a second, which is good. And we're kind of happy. We've come a long way. But we've only come halfway. Look at that. We've still got a little way to go here. So the next thing we need to do is to follow on the investigation with a bunch of other uh, tricks and optimizations. But I'm first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to detour a little bit here into, well, what if we don't use the, the uh, para-virtualized software stack? What if we don't use the software-defined pathway? And we go to the SRIOV capability instead. And with single stream TCP now, we get up to about 42 gigabits a second, which is a pretty big leap. So that's, that's nice, and we'd be very happy with that. It has some drawbacks, which I will cover later. But then we think, well, why are we virtualizing now? We've, 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 we've got this physical NIC passed through. Why don't we just look at the bare metal performance? And the Mellanox NIC gives us 46 gigs out of 48 top on a 50 gig line. So it's 48 after protocol with the um, 1500 bytes MTU. So this is, this is a pretty good uh, solution. What this graph shows, I think, is like a, a continuum of convenience. So in one, in one screen, we've got the whole sort of, do I want to virtualize or do I want to go bare metal? And at the bottom here, we've got completely convenient virtualization. We installed Red Hat, OSP, we set it up, we booted, we didn't have to think about it too much, and we get a very flexible, well-supported solution, which works. And then kind of in the middle, we think, well, we've cranked the handle and we tweak the, um, uh, tweak the hell out of it, and, and we get this machine which is, which is getting pretty good. And then we think, well, we start using hardware offloads, and this throws away a whole load of useful capabilities in OpenStack, but it gets us this big boost in performance. And then we think, well, if we don't virtualize at all, 
we throw away even more stuff. I mean, we, we're basically just using OpenStack to manage bare metal, and it's, it's, you don't get a lot of the convenience and the comfort of a virtualized environment here, but we get a real tasty performance from that. So VXLAN is good, but and SRIOV and bare metal, they're good as well, but they're good for different reasons. Bare metal, we can't migrate. You, in a VM system, you can, you can kind of put a whole ton of VMs onto one machine. In a bare metal system, you put one instance on every one of your systems. You soon run out of hardware in a bare metal system. You can't migrate them. You have no firewall. There's a whole load of problems. This is interesting, though. This, um, this piece, I think uh, DK on Monday pointed to some work on SRIOV and live migration. I've heard of similar projects elsewhere. This is coming. So that second graph, or that second line on the graph, we're about to get a new point, a new capability when we use SRIOV. VLANs, which is what you get with SRIOV, they kind of have knock-on effects in how you create your network. So you have to use a, a VLAN network separation with SRIOV, and that kind of means you've got to have a layer two network, which then has limits on the scalability of your layer two broadcast domain across your fabric. So on our machine, on the, this, this system at Cambridge, we use the strength of OpenStack here. So we can pick and choose, and we can use different solutions from that continuum at different points, so, so it depends what we want to do. When we've got uh, VMs talking to the outside world, they use the software-defined path. They get the firewalls, they get the migration, they get nice and secure, they're monitored, they're easy to use. And that's what we use by default. So, so when, when users turn up and on day one, they, they fire up some VMs and they start doing some science, or they start looking at some brains and whatever. Um, that's the kind of networking that they're going to be using. But as soon as they start saying, well, actually, I, I want to use MPI, or I want to use Lustre, or I want to use anything else that's going to be involving RDMA, then we start using internal networks only for this. So we, we offer them SRIOV instances, flavors that have those enabled, and then we get the full sort of very low latency, very high bandwidth, RDMA offloaded, uh, capabilities of the NIC used to its strength. And then we do the same thing inside the hypervisor. So we have this ability then to do offloaded storage with high performance inside the hypervisor where we choose to use it for hot buffer work. It's a pretty cool combination. Some more things we need to do on this experiment. So I did this work late last year and straight away I learned of a new firewall driver which cuts a couple of layers out of the software hierarchy. And then I spoke to uh, Mike and the team at Indiana and they said, well, why, do, why are you using OVS anyway? Why don't you use Linux Bridge? That's what they do. They get much better performance than I do, uh, which I'm kind of embarrassed about. But um, the going for Linux Bridge involves ripping out a piece of the Red Hat config and putting in a different piece. So we, we've got to be kind of sensitive about doing that. And then this is something that we've been working on for the last couple of months, which is this new Mellanox firmware called ASAP Squared. This is the way that we can take the best strengths of SRIOV and wrap that up in a cloud context. So we put it into a VXLAN uh, encapsulated network, and we also apply security groups. So we get the firewalls, uh, we get VXLAN encoding, we get layer three, and we get the performance that we get with SRIOV only it's not quite there yet. So, so we're pretty close with that, and we've been working with some of the guys at Mellanox on getting ASAP squared onto our development environment and getting it to perform in a way which really sings. Currently, we're just about at the performance we get from not using ASAP squared, only we use zero CPU because we're offloading open vSwitch, which is a massive, massive chunk of what the hypervisor is doing to keep all those plates in the air. So that, that's something that we're really excited about. And in fact, we're particularly excited about using this inside of the router nodes, inside of the network gateways on our system to create line speed in and out, ingest bandwidth into our OpenStack cloud. So what's left? 
there's a bunch of stuff that OpenStack doesn't do. So the average OpenStack machine median is about 100 nodes. 1,000 nodes is big for OpenStack. It's, there are people who do it in the scale of tens of thousands of nodes. Um, there are some massive OpenStack clouds, but generally what they tend to do is just buy another cloud, buy another data center. The failure domain is too big when you get bigger than that. So people like AT&T, they have 77 OpenStack clouds spread globally. They don't have any single one which is truly massive, but all of them are big. The complexity of OpenStack infrastructure is not good. <laughs> and when it comes to upgrading it, it gets worse. So most people, when they upgrade, they actually kind of do a side grade, which is they buy the new hardware, and they kind of install the new OpenStack on the new hardware, and then they kind of subsume nodes in steady and, and a steady trickle from the old cloud, and then they cut over when there's nothing left. Upgrading in place is, is a work in progress. People demonstrated it. Uh, people have demonstrated it for a couple of years, but it is an experiment sometimes, it seems. So the other piece that I'm really interested in is the bare metal feature set. So this idea of being able to use OpenStack and kind of physicalize virtualization is really, really interesting. And that's, that's, the, that's where it is for me. That's where the action is. How do we create the effect of everything that the hypervisor is doing in a world where there is no hypervisor. There's some really crafty stuff going on there, and it, it's an area which is developing very fast. So the other piece is, I mean, workload management. OpenStack doesn't really do queuing in the same way that if you ever go to an ice cream shop in Italy, it doesn't really do queuing either. Everyone runs to the front, grabs one, and runs off. OpenStack, I mean, queue management is not something that OpenStack does well. So this idea that you have a Slurm queue or something, no, no, that's not how OpenStack really thinks about things. It says everyone can have some of what they, what they asked for, but not, you don't get everything waiting in turn in an orderly line. Being able to do that in a way so that we can have um, an OpenStack system where you can reserve a large portion of the system for, say, like a, a weather forecast run or something, those are pieces that are solved at the platform level today and could be solved at the infrastructure level tomorrow. So to, to go around some of these problems, we created this thing called the Scientific Working Group. We did that in Austin um, around about this time last year. This is just a year ago. We had about 100 institutions turn up to the first event. We were so clearly knocking on an open door. And since then, it's really gathered in momentum. It's been a massive change in the way that OpenStack perceives scientific computing, which turns out to be a very substantial proportion of the total OpenStack installed base. We're not the weirdos in the corner of the room, at least not, not so much, um, in OpenStack. We're actually a significant, a significant proportion of how OpenStack is used today is used in research computing and HPC-like computing. It's like this, the second car in an HPC garage in that you've got this tightly coupled, InfiniBand connected HPC facility, but then you have the facility for the long tail, for everything else. And that's where OpenStack fits in and where it really sings. So over the summer last year, we, we actually put together a book across the scientific working group. We put together this, which you can download for free over here. And this is a kind of book which describes what we know, how things work, who's doing things that are good, where are the cutting edges at the moment, and what the problems are. And so if you're interested in looking at OpenStack and um, maybe seeing if that's a fit in your institution, this is probably a good place to start. So you've got to wonder what, what the OpenStack Foundation actually think about all of this. I mean, they're really behind it, as far as I can see. We, um, we sent, um, I sent a mail to, um, to the OpenStack uh, Foundation, to the board, and said, why don't you guys come and see us at Cambridge? And you know, we'll, we'll talk, and we'll talk about research computing, and, um, and we'll have a good old time together. And they came, and we were so happy, because this is, this is Jonathan Bryce, this is Lauren Self from the OpenStack Foundation, and uh, there's us working at Cambridge. Jonathan is holding Principia Mathematica, Isaac Newton's book in which he postulated the inverse square law of gravity. It's to celebrate the release of OpenStack Newton, 
which is nothing to do with Isaac Newton. It's like a town in Texas, I think. But, but why spoil it with a, uh, uh, why spoil a good photo? We had a great discussion. These guys, these guys love it. They love this idea that OpenStack can be used in this way. And um, I, think, uh, I think we loved it too, actually. It was, uh, it was a great time. So on that, and the gravity brings us nicely full, full circle. Thank you very much. Any questions? Rich? I think it depends where you go. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's any number of ways that you can actually install OpenStack, and there are definitely ways where you get OpenStack for free if your time costs you nothing. So, I mean, that's the way to really understand the workings of the system, but it's also the way to give you gray hair. But you can also get, you, I mean, you can use OpenStack as an appliance on the cloud, or you can have guys come and deliver an OpenStack-ready system into your data center if you don't want to get your hands dirty, and they will actually manage it as a, as a service off-site. So there's a whole spectrum of ways between that. And um, I mean, the, the way that we took with the first Cambridge machine was kind of more towards the service end in that we, we worked with Red Hat uh, to deploy the machine. And um, so we had some on-site consultancy, enough to train the guys up to, to manage it. The second system we did was far more experimental, the bare metal one. And um, we've been using more of the cutting edge upstream technologies for that one to bring in some, some of the sort of the future stuff and see what's out there. So, using Apache Mesos as a way of managing bare metal instead of OpenStack? That's an interesting question, and it's kind of, um, it's kind of interesting to, to look at which way the wind's blowing with that. And I think the momentum is with the OpenStackers, but most of my focus is on them. So it could be that Mesos is coming along um, a long way, um, sort of outside of my blinkered vision. But the way I see it is that OpenStack is adapting so much that it is actually going to offer the flexibility to do, it, it's not exactly going to be all things to all people, but it's going to be most things to a lot of people. And I think that's something that Mesos is, is not doing, it. it's focusing on a specific um, use case. And I think OpenStack might actually win on flexibility terms there. That's my guess. But I mean, be, it's a very good point about this whole sort of convergence of virtualized infrastructure and containerized workload management, the sort of OpenStack and Kubernetes and where they sit together. There's a lot going on in that space, and it's going to be very interesting to see where things shake out in, in that space. Upcoming OpenStack developments that are exciting. Oh, wow. <laughs> One of the things that I think is really exciting is not a technical reason, but it's a sort of a social, social reason, uh, which is this idea about the way that the OpenStack summits are evolving into what they call the forum. And the forum is this place where users and administrators, operators, and developers can come together, and the people who are actually using OpenStack and wanting new things or, or seeing things that are gaps in what they've got, they can actually then voice their, their grievances or their, their, their needs to developers and hear about either, yeah, that's a great idea, I didn't think of that, or this is not such a great idea because of that. The, the forum is coming in the first, or the next OpenStack Summit in May in Boston, and I think it's gonna be a big hit. In fact, I think it already is a big hit because of the discussion that it's stimulating in preparation for the forum, in preparation for the debate, there is debate, and I think that's a wonderful thing.
That's an interesting question. So the OpenStack vendors, I think, aren't really, they haven't really got their attention on HPC because it's, it's not nearly as um, interesting for them as the enterprise um, field in terms of OpenStack private clouds. So companies like um, Red Hat and Canonical and SUSE, they have some interest, but they don't have deep expertise in the HPC space. So if a customer came to them and said, I would like you to make me this machine, they will make a machine which is kind of enterprise tuned rather than a machine which is HPC tuned. I think there are more specialist players like Bright who are coming in with some interesting offerings in terms of the more the turnkey side of OpenStack deployments. And that's, that's one to watch. But um, from my point of view, and certainly the place where my company is placed, I'm much more towards the do-it-yourself do end of the spectrum with people who are looking at managing their own OpenStack infrastructure with their own skilled up teams and helping those guys to become skilled up in this, this uh, sort of ecosystem, which is radically different from the sort of the best practices of HPC ecosystem. It's a massive learning curve going from one to the other. They kind of look the same and kind of achieve the same thing, but underneath they're totally different in many respects.